I recently received the annual outreach magazine's The 100 Fastest Growing Churches in America. It's published every fall, and they, along with Lifeway, do a study. And of course, as you can tell, its focus is on the top growing churches in America. And there are many fascinating things in that magazine, many fascinating things about those churches. One of those facts is that non-denominational churches make up the largest portion, 41 of the 100 are non-denominational. And the other second Southern Baptists are 27. They're the second largest number. But interestingly, an even larger portion of those churches have no denomination listed in their name. No Baptist, no Methodist. 80 of the churches have no denomination. Names like the Rock Church or the Journey Church or Life Church. or There are many community churches like Northview Community or whatever community they're in. Uh, they're very popular. Actually, there's a few that don't even have church in the name. The Journey or the Summit or whatever. Now, I'm not criticizing that. Uh, I really don't care. But what I do think about that and what I did uh, think as I studied this week is there's a name from the scriptures that really every church should have. And that's the one another church. Because in the New Testament, 59 times... The Christians and churches are told to one another with each other. We've been studying this series of messages, Strengthen What Remains. It's based on Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, when Jesus said to the church at Sardis, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And we've talked about one of the things we need to strengthen in our own lives, in our church, is what it means to be a member of a church. What does it mean to be a part of, a member of a New Testament church? And while there is a formal process and we ought to be a part of that, there's more called for an active lifestyle in the New Testament. A lifestyle of loving one another and caring for one another and serving one another and honoring one another. Those are just a few of those 59 one another's or each other's that are found in the New Testament. Over and over again, we see these one another's and these each other's. And they're very important. When I started this series, I talked about uh, churches that are dying And mentioned that there are churches around us. I heard of another one just this week. And then recently I received in the mail. uh, I could buy a church. Uh, It's for sale. A former church that went out of business. Uh, uh, I'm not in the market. But uh, uh, I got one of these. Would we want one there for sale? Uh, Because they closed. Now, folks, I'm not preaching this series of messages because I'm hoping we'll survive. I'm preaching this series of messages because I believe we're going to thrive. But we need to know what thriving means. Christians need to understand what it means to be a part of a church. And for a church to thrive is according to what God says, not according to what man says. And if church thrives, it becomes a one another church. It becomes what God says it will be. And part of that is one another Loving and serving one another. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Begin there reading God's word. We're going to read to verse 11. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, May you bless the reading and the teaching and the hearing of your word. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says today, Lord. And if there's one here today that doesn't know you, today would be the day when they become part of your family. They become part of your church. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who know you, Father, change our hearts that we can be the people in the church that will 
bring glory and honor to Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Peter is writing to a group of persecuted Christians. They were scattered across the northern part of Asia Minor. We read this in chapter 1, verse 1. The very first words out of Peter's pen or out of Peter's mouth, you might say. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims. And that was his word. He used that several times for Christians, the pilgrims. Because the reality is, is that this is not our home. Now, this really isn't anyone's home. But everyone's passing through. His idea is Christians are not, they're they're sojourners. They're passing through. This is not the last place for us. We have a home in heaven because Jesus has paid the price for us. And he says, to the pilgrims of the dispersion, these were Jews. They had been dispersed out through these areas, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Jews from those regions, if you go back and read Acts chapter 2, Jews from those regions had come to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and they came to celebrate Pentecost. And uh, they heard Peter preach the gospel, and they were part of the 3,000 people that got saved. You know, when I went to church the the night I got saved, I wasn't planning on getting saved either. But God intersected me. A bunch of people went to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and they got the gospel, and they went out praising the Lord. They got saved. They didn't plan on it. Maybe you're here today. You, you came to appease somebody. You came because you thought, well, I'll, I'll check it out. And God speaks to you and says, I love you. And Jesus died on the cross for you. And if you'll believe me, I'll save you. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, when they left Pentecost, they left Jerusalem. They went back to these regions, Pontus and Galatia and all these places. And you know what they did? They started churches. There weren't any churches there. But because Christians are part of the church, they started one. Imagine that. That's what Christians do. They gather and worship. So they started these churches. Now, 30 years have passed, and they're being persecuted. The Roman Empire is persecuting all the Christians, and these people are being persecuted. You read, the first, you read first Peter, there's a lot about suffering in this book because they're suffering for their faith. And now Peter reminds them that the, the end of all things is at hand, meaning that the Lord's return is imminent. Jesus could come at any time. Now, somebody may say, well, Peter wrote this roughly 2,000 years ago, and it's been a long time, and uh, he made it sound like it was going to happen quickly. Well, Peter didn't know. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour, right? right? But Peter knew this, Jesus could come at any time. Then and today, Jesus could come at any time. At any moment, Jesus could come. You and I need to live in light of the imminent return of Jesus. We don't need to spend all our time. Let me see if I can figure out when he's going to come. You just figure out how to live for him. Let him take care of the coming and you take care of the living. You take care of the believing and the following. He'll take care of his end. So Peter tells these folks the end is at hand. It's imminent. Jesus could come at any moment. And then with that in mind, part of living it out is to be a one another church, to love one another and to do all these things that God tells us. Now, Peter doesn't give us all the list here, but he gives us three things that I think are very important for us at this time as a church that we need to be about doing these things. So three things that we learn from this text that should be part of our lives as Christians, part of our lives as a church. Number one, we need to pray for one another properly. We need to pray for one another properly. The command to pray for one another isn't in this text. We know it's all over the New Testament. The command here is to be serious and watchful in our prayers. Look at that. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of verse 7. He's assuming they pray. Most people pray. But Peter says you need to pray properly. You need to be serious. One of the ways we can be a one another church is to pray for one another and to pray with one another. To pray properly is to pray for the needs of other people. Now sometimes those needs are requested. Somebody has an ailment. Somebody has a family situation. Somebody has a job situation. And we definitely want to know those and we pray for those. And we need to be in groups of people that are praying for us. But we also need to learn to pray in other ways. Last Sunday evening, we studied a portion of Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. In that prayer, if you go read it, Jesus prayed for himself. He prayed for those men in that room with him, those 11 that were left. But then he also prayed for those who would believe their word. You know who that is? That's us. You know how you got saved? You heard the gospel. You heard the message of the gospel and the the, the 
apostles wrote that message in the Bible. You became one of those who believed through their word. So Jesus prayed for us that night. And one of the things he prayed for them and for us is that the Father would keep us from the world and from the evil one while we were still here. He prayed that we as Christian people would be kept from the world. We wouldn't go off and live in the world and walk in the world and live like the world. And that the evil one would not have us. He would not be able to overcome us. Well, you don't think that stuck with Peter? Look over in chapter 5. You have your Bibles open? Look at chapter 5, verse 8. Chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Look what he says. Be sober, be vigilant. By the way, these are very similar words. To what he uses back in chapter 4, verse 7, be serious and watchful. Very similar words, sober and serious, vigilant, watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil walks about seeking which one he can pull out of the flock, which one he can drag off, which one he can tear away, which one he can destroy. The devil wants, some Christians to, don't realize it, but the devil will devour them and they'll waste years of their life in the world and years of their life following their own desires and years of their life being led astray by the world and the flesh and the devil. And they're still saved people, but they waste years and years and years. We talked about it Wednesday night and they always come back broken and busted and torn and tattered. And, 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 for wor- and worse for where? But we're to pray for one another. We're to pray for one another to be strong in the Lord. This is what it means to pray properly. Not just for our temporal concerns. And we spend a lot of time, and it's okay to pray for temporal concerns. But are we praying for eternal spiritual things? Do we spend time praying for the people around us in Sunday school that the, that the enemy will not have them? Do we spend time praying they'll be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Or we just assume because they're sitting in church that they are? There's a lot of people sitting in church that are as weak spiritually as they've ever been. And the devil's walking about close to them, ready to devour them. This is why Paul writes in Ephesians 6.18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Look at this. Being watchful. There it is again, being watchful. What does it mean to be watchful in your prayers? It means your prayers are not just a routine. Your prayers are not something that you memorize and you just say and you go on with no mind engagement. Right? You can do a lot of things with no mind engagement. You can come to church. You, you, listen, you can, you can read the Bible. Your mind's not engaged. You're worried about what well, here, there, Being watchful means to have your heart and your mind engaged. To this end, with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, stay with it, persevere, and pray for all the saints. No Christian uh, is beyond prayer, and no Christian is uh, beyond the need of prayer. We need prayer because we struggle with temptation and discouragement. We grow weary in well-doing. We lose heart. We give up at times. We are overcome by temptation. We want to grow, and we don't know how. We need to pray for one another And let me ask you, who in this church knows you well enough that they're praying for your spiritual life? Who do you know well enough that you're praying for their spiritual life? You're praying for their soul to grow and prosper in the Lord. It's okay to pray for these other things, but let me tell you something. We spend a lot of time praying for stuff that the minute you die, it's over with. It's burned up. It don't matter anymore. We spend all our time praying for stuff that the minute you die, that does not matter to you at all. But we rarely pray for things that are going to matter completely and totally when we die. So we need to pray for one another properly. Who do you know that's praying for you that way and who are you praying for that way? Be watchful. Second thing, we are to pray for one another properly. Secondly, We are to love one another fervently. We are to love one another fervently. Verse number 8. And above all things. Stop there. Those are four very important words. And above all things. That speaks of priority. It speaks of moving to the front of the line. Above all things. Above our services. Above our sermons above our ministries, above our agendas, above our classes, above our preferences and our wants and our desires and our likes, above all of that, above all things, we are to love. 
of all the New Testament commands that are given to the Christians, how they deal with one another, to love or to have brotherly love is the most often repeated command. Now, it should not come as a surprise to us that God repeats that over and over again. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the New Testament particularly. It should not come as a surprise to us. And while it's true it's the most often repeated command, that's because it's the most difficult. You know, you can do many things. You can live out many of the other commands. You can teach a lesson. You can preach a sermon. You can witness. You can assist someone in trouble. You can... um, Listen to someone. You can even pray for someone. And you can actually do those things without love. It's been said that you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can do those things because you're supposed to. You can do those things because the class has organized it. And you can do those things because it's a good idea or we've always done it. But because of the difficulty of loving one another and the demand that love makes on us, It's easy to believe, have faith, be saved, attend church, but do so without really loving the people around us. When we love, God is blessed, but when we do church without love, it hinders the church. It hinders the church from being what we're supposed to be, not just in here, but everywhere. It hinders us from loving our neighbors. It hinders us from sharing the gospel when we do things without love. Chris Williams is the pastor of Fellowship Greenwood, and he preached here before. This is the church where Sean and Kelly Jones serve. And a few years ago, Chris, uh, he was writing an article about their church. And a few years ago, they were running about 150 people. And, uh, but today, they're a healthy evangelistic church. They have grown 20% a year for four years. They... They average about 700 people now. When Chris became the pastor, he realized that Fellowship Greenwood had to start living out the love of one, love one another, or excuse me, the one another statements of the scriptures, the forgive one another, be patient with one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens. And he realized that we could not love our neighbors Until we could love each other. Now we would think that's automatic. But how many of you know there's nothing automatic? There is nothing automatic. Because you're married doesn't mean that you're you're loving your spouse. It's not automatic. Peter tells us about this love here. Three things he says about the type of love that we're to have for one another. One, it's a love that costs. It's a love that costs. Notice what he says there in verse 8. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Have fervent love. The word fervent is often tied to heat, but this Greek word is a different word. It's a word that means to be stretched or to be strained. To be stretched out. It's actually used often in Greek literature. You know, the Greeks were big into athletics. They're kind of like us in America. They loved athletic contests. They would fill stadiums. This is where the, the Olympics came from was the Greek culture. And this picture's a runner who was running with all of his might or all of her might. Running as hard as they can. Stretching every bit of their body, every muscle in their body to break that tape and to be the first one to cross the line. To stretch themselves out. To strain themselves to the finish line. It was a picture of maximum effort and maximum output. Peter had already told the believers there this same type of thing. Look back at chapter 1 if you have your Bible. Chapter 1 verse 22 look what he says there and you can see that he knew it was a needed uh, a needed theme for them. That they needed to hear this. Verse 22 look at this since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the, script, through the spirit When did you purify your souls? When you got saved. One of the great things about getting saved is God washes you and cleanses you in the blood of Jesus. Been washed in the blood of of Jesus. We sing, been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Well, the book of Revelation says he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Your souls have been purified now because you've been purified. Look, he says, in sincere love of the brethren, real love. 
Love one another fervently, stretched out with a pure heart. In sincere love, stretch yourself out in showing this type of love. Strain yourself to show this type of love. Warren Wiersbe wrote this, Christian love is something we have to work at, just the way an athlete works on his skills. It's not a matter of an emotional feeling, though that is included, listen to this, but of a dedicated will. Feelings pass, don't they? Emotions pass. But your will has to be dedicated to do this. Now imagine when Peter wrote these words and he thought about this love that Jesus demanded of these, these, this, these Christians. He probably thought back to how many times Jesus taught them about love. We were just talking about John chapter 17. It's when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples the night before he's arrested and crucified. And in chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, I imagine these words stuck with Peter all of his life. Look at this. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He didn't say love one another. He said, I'm going to tell you how you love one another as I've loved you. Last week, we studied Ephesians chapter 5, remember? And you look in that text and, and Jesus talked to, through, through Paul talked to the husbands and he said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. Any husband, I told you, that's the only verse you need for your marriage. That's it. That'll, that'll solve all that. You just, you just man, i got to figure out some passage of Scripture that will help me get into that one. Just get into that one and you'll be saying, oh me, oh my, Lord, help me. Well, here he says to these disciples, as I've loved you, and they're thinking about how he loved them. Well, well he, he loved us. Man, he was personally involved with us. He spent all this time with us. He was patient with us. We done stuff, and Peter's probably looking back. We, we said things. You know, Peter was the apostle of the open mouth, insert foot type. He was always doing that. He was patient with me. He was gracious to me. One time I was even standing in the way of God's plan, and he told me, get behind me, Satan. And then a little while later, he just embraced me. He was merciful with me. In that scene in John 13, you know what he'd just done? You know your Bibles a little bit. He'd just washed their feet. He just got down on his knees with a towel and a basin, and he just washed their dirty, nasty feet. That's the lowest position in their culture was to live in somebody's home, be a servant who washed the feet of people. It was basically the lowest position of a household servant. Jesus got on his knees with a, with a basin of water and a towel, and he washed their feet. And the Bible says he loved them to the end. This is, this is in Jesus' mind. I mean, in John, Peter's mind and in his conscience, he's thinking back how he loved them. And then Jesus loved them fervently. He stretched his arms out on a cross. And he hung there naked and beaten before the world. And he did it because he loved Peter and because he loved you. His fervent love cost him the blood, his blood, his life, the life blood drained out of him. This is the type of love that he tells us to have, to stretch ourselves out. What if we stretched ourselves out in love like this? Paul knew about this type of love. In Romans, the book of Romans, I was reading it. You read the last five chapters of Romans, verse 12 through 16. It's really all application. There's a, lot, there's a little theology, but more of it is application of what he's taught through the first 11 chapters. And you read it over and over again, and he talks about love. Look what he says in Romans 12, 10. Be devoted. He's talking to these Christians. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. We think of that as like marriage. I'm devoted to my wife. I'm hopelessly devoted to you. I just want to see if some of y'all were awake. Uh, Give preference to one another in honor. Give preference to this other person. Honor them. Romans 13, 8, look at this. Oh, no one anything. He's writing that section about how we deal with the government. He's talking about taxes and he's talking about honor the rulers that God set over us. Government comes from God. He's talking about taxes there. Don't, don't owe you taxes. Don't be derelict in your taxes. And he says, as a matter of fact, oh, no one anything. Here's what you owe except to love one another. This is what you owe. You owe love to one another, for he who loves has fulfilled the law. What you owe is to love those believers around you. That's your debt. 
What if we love one another like that? So much so that we each said, you can count on me. I owe it to you that you can count on me. I will do my best not to let you down. And when I let you down, I'll ask you to forgive me. And when you let me down, I'll forgive you, whether you ask or not. This is stretching yourself out in love. In a culture that always wants to rail about being mistreated or not getting our rights, you and I have the, the debt of loving one another, the right to love one another. It's a love that costs. Secondly, it's a love that covers. It's a love that covers Love will cover a multitude of sins, Peter says there in verse number 8. And then he's quoting Proverbs 10, 12. He's quoting, paraphrasing this verse. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. It doesn't mean love condones sin. If we love somebody, we're grieved when they sin. If you love someone, you're grieved when they sin. If you're a parent and you, your children sin... You're not just grieved they did wrong. You're grieved that they sinned because sin is going to bring detriment to them. It's going to bring bad things to them. The wages of sin is still death. And they're going to suffer because of the choices and decisions they make. It's not just that they didn't follow our rules or they're embarrassing us. You love them. And if you're a Christian, you understand that sin always brings about consequences. It may not happen today and it may not happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen. Sin is going to bring about consequence. And because you love them, you don't want to see them suffer the consequence. You're grieved when they sin. And if you love a Christian, you're grieved when they sin. Love doesn't condone sin, but rather it covers that sin in love, motivated to keep it from others and not spread it abroad. Because we love, we don't want to talk about that person's sin with other people. We may talk about it with them because we love them. But we don't want to talk about it with everybody else. Doesn't mean we never confront sin. Do we never spread it? Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. We want to help that person over that sin. We studied recently the book of Galatians, every verse in the book of Galatians, and we came to the sixth chapter. In the chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And we said that passage means it speaks of uh, restoring, speaks of resetting a bone, because sin brings brokenness. It'll break your fellowship. It'll break your faith. It'll break your prayer life. It'll break your marriage. It'll break your family. So what we want to do is restore. We want to reset the bone. We want to bring back to usefulness. But we do it in the spirit of gentleness, a spirit of love, a spirit of patience, realizing that I'm not any better than he or she because I could be tempted in a minute. I could fall very quickly myself. But we want to restore one another. Why? Because we love them. And when they sin and they sin against us, we overlook a fault as long as we possibly can. And when we can't overlook the fault anymore, we still don't hold a grudge. Proverbs 19, 11, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. The discretion of a man. He doesn't want to spread it. He's discreet. He's wise. He's discerning. He wants to be slow to anger. The Bible speaks often of a man quick to anger. Quick to anger. Quick to judge. Quick to criticize. It's God. God says his glory is to overlook a transgression. And I think this sums up what Jesus said, what we just read. When Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not that you have church together. Not that we have a fellowship meal every now and then. I mean, I can eat with almost anybody. <laughs> Especially if the food's good. I'm not paying attention to you anyhow. <laughs> but what about loving one another like this? This is they'll know we're his disciples. Because this is the kind of love 
that only Jesus can share and only Jesus can share through us. The third thing Peter says about this love, it is a love that cares. It's a love that costs. You have to stretch yourself out. It's a love that covers. It helps people deal with their sins, but it's also a love that cares. Verse number nine, be hospitable to one another without grumbling, without grumbling. Hospitality. It is a very important word in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. The New Testament word there in the Greek meant love of strangers. Uh, It meant to be open to, to show kindness to, the opening of your heart, the opening of your life, the opening of your home. It was actually expected of New Testament Christians. This was one of their expectations, that you would be open and hospitable. When Christians traveled in this day, preachers or just Christians in general, they would often travel and they would stay in the homes of other believers. One of the reasons was that many times they couldn't afford to stay in the inns, but the inns were often unsafe, unsanitary, ungodly, wicked, dangerous places. They were often uh, houses of ill repute. Christians didn't want to be seen there. By the way, there's some places you ought not want to be seen. There's some places you have no business going into, so nobody has to see you coming out. That's all free. That wasn't even part of the message there. (laughs) But New Testament Christians were expected to open their homes to people that maybe they didn't know at all or they had heard of. Someone else knew would recommend them or maybe people that they did know, but they knew they had a lot of issues. They knew they had a lot of needs. A church ought to be a place of hospitality. It ought to begin... When we come in this place, that we're a friendly and hospitable people. That we welcome one another. We welcome everyone. And you do a really good job of that. But we always ought to keep that. We always ought to to be welcoming and, and, and greeting and sharing that with one another. And it's become more and more, more and more of a problem, it seems. I, you know, I, I get a lot of emails and things. And because we have... More and more, and I I don't say this in any way to insult anyone, but we have more and more social anxiety than any time in our history. People are socially anxious. They're socially uncomfortable. So we have to be welcoming and friendly. But it seems that many times in church, many of us would just rather come in. Those of us who don't even have any kind of anxiety, we would just rather come in and not be bothered with people. We'd like to come in and and get our seat and hear what's going on and not really be bothered with people. And it's become such a thing that I get these emails and these debates about from church growth experts. And a few years ago, I started to get and they say, listen, we've done a lot of surveys and people don't really want that welcome time. They don't want to shake hands with people. uh, So you need to drop that. You need to drop that. I'm like, okay. Well, listen, they complain that we're not friendly as it is. Now they're complaining we're too friendly as it is. And so I love the Babylon Bee. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The Babylon Bee is a satire site. If you follow it on Facebook or Twitter, these people at the Babylon Bee, I am am convinced they are my brothers from another mother. (laughs) I I love the stuff they write because, just to be honest with you, they make fun of everybody. I mean, there's no, there's that, everybody, politicians, athletes, preachers, they get them all. And no matter what kind of preacher you are, and churches. So a year or so ago, they had this on their satire site. This is, this is their post they had. Local church offers introvert service where nobody has to talk to anyone else. <laughs> Here it is. Here's the headline. Faith Life Church. Remember, there's no denomination. They got that right. Faith Life Church revealed Thursday the unprecedented popularity of their newly launched introvert service. A church service where believers averse to social situations can come and worship the Lord without ever having to talk to anyone else. Taking place after both the traditional and contemporary services, this new service allows congregants to enjoy church in silence without being forced to greet each other, without saying a word, without touching each other, or engaging in never-ending small talk afterward. It's unbelievable, self-described introvert and church member Anita Kimball said. I've struggled my whole life with the church traditions that forced me to invite people into my bubble. No more turning and greeting my neighbor with some contrived cliche or having to hug Mr. Jenkins or lying after church that I really want to get together with so-and-so. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) 
<laughs> At publishing time, the Faith Life elders had confirmed that they were in the market for a new church building to accommodate the expansion of attendance in that service. But what do they do with this? Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now, you know the Middle Eastern culture. They kissed one another. They still do it. You ever seen on TV? These men kiss each other. Now, I'm just being honest. I don't want to kiss no hairy face. <laughs> I'm just being honest. But the point of this verse is this was a cultural way of greeting one another. And he said, you do it. And you welcome one another. Our cultural way is not that. But our cultural way is to be open and to welcome people, and to speak to people. You know, we're a friendly church, but we got to move past being friendly to becoming friends. we got to move past just being friendly. we got to become friends. God wants us to do more than greet people at church. He wants us to share life together, to learn to be a family. We're going to be starting something pretty soon. We're, we're working on some new groups, life groups. We want every person here to be involved in a small group where we can uh, get to know one another. Either Sunday school class, if you won't go to that, we want to do some life groups or something where we can be hospitable. And notice, Peter puts this little tag at the end just because he's dealing with people. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. <laughs> Just in case, without grumbling. It means without mumbling or complaining. It was expected of them. And you know what? To love one another fervently is still expected of us. The Bible hasn't changed. Cultures don't change the Bible. If you'll believe the Bible, enough people believe it, the Bible will change the culture. Chuck Swindoll said this, Being truly hospitable can cost money. It definitely takes time. It can become inconvenient and occasionally frustrating. Peter urges believers to have a positive attitude towards hospitality, one that flows from fervent love and prayerful hope. Love one another fervently. The last thing we're going to touch on very quickly is this. We are to serve one another. We are to serve one another uh, faithfully. Serve one another faithfully. Look at verse 10 and 11. He moves in from this hospitality to the spiritual gifts that each Christian has been giving, given. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. A couple of things about serving one another faithfully. How you and I are served to serve. Jesus said he came to serve and not be served. And he said the greatest among you will be your servant. Well, here's four, four quick truths that we learned in this text that we just read. God has given each one of us a gift. Every Christian has been given spiritual gifts. Gifts and abilities that God supplied to you when he gave you the Holy Spirit. When you were saved, God gave you something that you can do for his kingdom. Uh, it may be a speaking gift and he talks about that. But he also talks about a serving gift. He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as he's speaking God's truth. If anyone ministers or anyone serves, it's the same, no, same word, minister or serves. You may have a serving gift, but you have something you can do for God. And you need to faithfully serve one another. Secondly, God gives us, each of, of us, the ability. He says the ability which God supplies. That word ability means uh, strength or might or energy or power. See, sometimes we say, man, I, I would do something. I just don't have the ability. I don't have the strength. I, I, don't have the, the, I just don't have the strength to do it. If you'll pray and ask God to give it to you, he will because he's already done it. He says it's there. You just got to seek him for it. You just got to seek him. He will give you the power and the ability. We're going to give you the opportunity. Next Sunday, we're going to have a, a little ministry fair set up after church, and it's going to list some ministries. If you want to be involved in a ministry, we're going to help set up something to get you connected, and you think about what gifts and abilities you have, and we're going to help you get connected. But there's the third thing. We are stewards of God's grace. This is our part. God gives to us. God gives gifts. God gives ability. So when God gives, you know what I am? I become responsible as a steward. Notice what he says in that text. As stewards... 
of the manifold grace of God. Manifold means multifaceted. It means uh, multi, it can be used to describe being multicolored. We have different gifts. We have God's grace is multifaceted. My gifts aren't your gifts. What God has called me to do, he hasn't called you to do, but he's called all of us to do something. And he's gifted every Christian for something, for his kingdom. Now your job is to steward that. What does that mean? We don't use that word steward. It means to be a manager. In the New Testament, stewards were often household managers. They would often manage the wealth or the uh, goods of their master. They had no wealth or goods of their own, but they were responsible to make sure they managed their master's gifts, their master's goods properly. See, you have no spiritual gift of your own, but God gave you something. And you're to manage it. And you know what part of managing it is? I, I got to manage my life so I can manage my gifts. If you never have time for priorities, it's because you're mismanaging your life. I'm going to be honest with you, almost all the time. If you never have any time, if you have children and you have any time for them, there's probably, you're, if you look at your life, you're not managing your life properly. If you never have time to serve God, there's a good chance maybe you're not managing your life properly. And here's the deal. You're not responsible to have gifts. God's not going to say, you know what? You should have had some spiritual gifts. God's going to say, no, I gave you those. You're not responsible to have the abilities. God's going to say, I gave you those. That was my responsibility. But your responsibility was to manage it. Your responsibility was to put it to use. Get your life in order where you could be a steward of God's grace. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's what God's looking for. It's required to be found faithful. That steward, when they balanced the books, the, ma the, the, the master wanted to know, is all my stuff accounted for? Has my money been accounted for? Have my goods been accounted for? Have you done what I've asked you to do? That's what God's going to say to us as Christians. There's one other thing. We serve for the good of others and for the glory of God. You notice it was one of those one another's. He says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. That's for the good of others. And the result is the glory of God that in all things, God may be glorified. That in all things, God may get the glory. A man approached a pastor at the end of a service and said, Pastor, I would like to join your church. He'd been attending for a while, and the man said, I'd like to join. The pastor said, well, great. He said, but I want you to know, Pastor, uh, I have a very busy schedule and a very busy life. I really can't be called on to do anything much. I can't be called on to serve. I, I can't help in a committee. I can't teach. I can't sing in the choir. I won't be available for any special projects. I won't be able to make any visits. I, I won't be able to uh, set up any chairs or uh, uh, help in any way, really. Pastor said, really? Is that right? He said, yeah. He said, I'll tell you what he said. You know, come to think of it, he said, I think you're at the wrong church. He said, but I have one for you. He said, you leave out of here and you go west about three blocks and on the corner, there's a church that you'll fit right into. The man after the service immediately got in his car, took off left, I mean west, drove out, three blocks, looked at the corner on the right where the pastor said and there was an old abandoned church building <laughs> that said for sale. It was closed. Might have been this one. Enough people, enough people do that. That's what happens. God's called us to be better than that. God's called us to serve for his glory, to love fervently, to pray properly. Some of you today need to get connected. Next Sunday, we're going to have our uh, next steps class. You can learn what it means to be a member and be a part of the church next Sunday at 9 o'clock. You can go sign up right out here when you leave. Out there's a table. Sign up. Some of you are part of this church. You're a member, but you need to get reconnected. Some of you need someone to pray for you because your spirit and your soul is not right. You've wandered. You've fallen. You've drifted. And you need to come back. You know, much of the Bible 
Much of the Bible is about return, return, return. Read the Old Testament. The prophets were always saying, return to me, says the Lord. Return to me with all your heart. Return. Maybe you need to return. Today's the day. God's spoken. And some of you are here today and maybe you've never really placed your faith in Jesus. There's never been a time when you realize that you're a sinner. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person. And that sin has separated every single person. Every person is separated from God by sin. And Jesus said, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. If there's never been a time when you repented, you turned from that way of life apart from God. And you turned and said, God, I'm a sinner. And I've done my own thing. And I've gone my own way. And while I've believed in you, I don't know you. For 23 years, I believed in God. There was not a single person alive who could have ever convinced me that God wasn't real. But before that night in February, when I got saved, if I'd have died, I'd have gone to hell believing there was a God. Totally convinced, believing in him, but not knowing him. Today, you may believe in him, but unless you repent, you don't know him. Turn from that. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Today you can be saved. You can be part of God's kingdom. You say, how do I know I can be saved? Do you want to be? If you want to be, God put that there. And if God put it there, he'll answer your prayer for salvation. Come to Jesus this morning. Let's pray together.